Well, good afternoon. My name is Martin Leon, and our co-chairman is uh, Georg Nikoneg. We have an outstanding panel and a very challenging and interesting topic, which is to address tricuspid regurgitation with annular reduction, focusing on the cardioband tricuspid system. I'll be introducing my uh, very uh, prestigious faculty in the next several minutes uh, as they uh, help us with important presentations. And I will quickly begin by describing some of the objectives of this one-hour session. So I believe the tricuspid valve is no longer forgotten. And the tricuspid regurgitation is now commonly identified in patients with coronary disease, other forms of valvular heart disease, as well as patients with long-standing atrial fibrillation, permanent pacemakers, and even some systemic illnesses. Unfortunately, the symptoms appear late in the course of the TR natural history, often in association with right ventricular failure, and usually with massive or torrential degrees of TR severity. Guideline-directed medical therapy is limited, consisting largely of diuretics with frequent congestive hepatopathy and cardiorenal syndrome. Many patients rapidly become diuretic resistant. Surgical therapy for sole TR is uncommonly the preferred treatment due to very high mortality, and even in the best centers, approximately 10%. So transcatheter strategies would be a welcomed addition to the TR therapy armamentarium, and that really is the purpose of this session. So the objectives are to highlight the natural history, clinical consequences, and therapy alternatives for patients with severe symptomatic TR, to learn about the CE Mark approved Edwards Cardioband Tricuspid Transcatheter Valve Reconstruction System, to understand how patients with TR and annular dilatation can benefit from a annular reduction system such as Cardioband, and in doing so to review the one-year follow-up data of the Tri-Repair study focusing on clinical and functional outcomes. And we like to speculate on how to identify the optimal patient candidates for annular reduction therapy, as well as some of the tips and tricks, especially imaging, which is problematic for us, and largely echo imaging during the procedure itself. And then finally, to discuss what the clinical impact might be on patients with an annular reduction system like CardioBand. To do this, again, as I mentioned, we have a very prestigious panel. We're going to begin with Alain. Barabi, who will talk about tricuspid valve disease and help us to understand what the current state of knowledge is. Claudius Jacob Shagan is going to talk about this innovative therapy for tricuspid valve disease, the Edwards Cardioband Annular Reduction System. Patricio Lancelotti will talk about how to identify the right patients for transcatheter treatment of TR. Stefan Baldus is going to um, help us by giving us some real patient data, looking at the impact of the cardioband system on patients with TR. And then George Nikoneg will give us a session evaluation and key learnings. And with his vast experience during the course of the hour, we'll certainly ask, I'm sure, many insightful questions. So with that, we'll go to our first speaker, Alain, who will talk to us about the tricuspid valve. Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure uh, to share with you the current knowledge of tracker speed uh, regurgitation. This is my disclosure. What do we currently know? We will see first the epidemiology and prognosis, and we will identify and distinguish clearly the three types of TR, the three groups. I am the echo guy in the heart team, so I will uh, focus on anatomy and echo anatomy with multi-modality imaging and to identify the three cusps. And finally, based on valve analysis, we will identify the three stages of the disease and adapt uh, the specific uh, therapeutic and treatment options based upon uh, individual stage. The three types of uh, tracker speed regurgitation, and it is very important when you analyze a patient for a clinician to distinguish clearly the primary TR 
where there is a primary damage of the leaflet or subvalvular apparatus. Secondary TR, which is the most predominant ideology uh, due to other causes like LV dysfunction, uh, valvular disease, uh, particularly the left side. And I it represents above 90% of cases. And isolated TR between 5 and 6% where there is no other uh, um, disease at the isolated TR, particularly in the setting of long-term atrial fibrillation with dilatation of right atrium. Based on this Mayo uh, study in the community, we identify the different etiology. As you have seen, the secondary TR left valvular pulmonary hypertension and LV dysfunction is clearly predominant uh, of uh, the etiology. Uh, based on the personal communication, Maurice Sarano told me he was uh, he has a, a paper in press for LV dysfunction representing if you have TR an increasing of 60% of mortality. Clearly, this uh, patient is often old. This is a group of TR as compared with other valve disease, and there is a predominant of female. Clearly, it's not only frequent, but it is associated with uh, excess of mortality in this group of isolated TR. Moreover, it is a very important uh, fact published by Wong recently. This excess of mortality, this excess of mortality is uh, independent of uh, different uh, criteria based on this meta-analysis involving more than 32,000 patients. And even uh, uh, we have twofold uh, increase uh, mortality when you have a moderate severe TR as compared with non-mild TR, independently, that's very important, of RV dysfunction, EF, MR, LV, ejection fraction, and pulmonary hypertension. In this uh, study, there was another interesting concept comparing the fast and development and the slow development. And you see that if you have a fast development, the group one here, you have a high excess of mortality. Fast development of TR means uh, a development, an increase of TR within 1.2 years as compared as slowest development within nine years. And it is interesting to see that the patient in this uh, period of time, any valvular surgery uh, without concomitant tracker speed surgery uh, <laughs> was associated with a higher risk of uh, development of significant TR. Let's see now the anatomy and the multi-modality uh, imaging. I am an imager, particularly an echocardiographer, and you see that by 3D echo, we are able to identify the three cusps, the anterior one here, the posterior one here, and the septal leaflet here. Please note that the surgeon often describe a sort of cleft between the uh, the middle part of the anterior leaflet, which can uh, be uh, difficult for some uh, th therapeutic option in transcatheter. You have to be aware of this uh, particular anatomy of cleft of the anterior leaflet. Again, it is a multimodality imaging with 3D echo, CT scan, MRI. The uh, echo mainly uh, is important for severity and valve analysis, guiding control, uh, Patricio will uh, elaborate on this. CT scan is important for the analyst, and MRI is particularly important for the right ventricular uh, uh, volume and function. There is an overlap of all these techniques, but if we concentrate on the severity of TR with these uh, three criteria, again, Becky Han has proposed with uh, Zamorano another classification, a new classification. It will be uh, described again by uh, Patricio, but this torrential uh, uh, grade is very important to keep in mind when you are talking about transcatheter option. Is there the any difference based on this uh, different classification? Yes, the, the fact you have a massive or torrential TR is associated with a higher and a bad prognosis as compared as severe, so it makes sense to do this distinction. Finally, based on valve analysis, and I suggest a very important 
papers. The first one was uh, uh, written by uh, Gilles Dreyfus and the other one by Tara Masso, which is a sort of uh, update of uh, the uh, concept of Dreyfus of the different stages. So you have to uh, clearly identify in your patient if he has a stage one. Stage one means there is a type one dysfunction with normally flat motion. And if you look at carefully the coaptation, it's very good, five to six, no tethering. In this case, if you have isolated TR, conservative management, no need for intervention. But if you have a concomitant TR with a dilated annulus, you, you can propose a tracheospeed preventive annuloplasty if the uh, annulus is above 40 millimeter. That corresponds to the class 2A indication of the ESC and IHA guidelines. <laughs> if we have a type 1 or discrete type 3B, it's a stage 2. What is the characteristic of this patient? There is a poor coaptation. You see, there is a poor coaptation, less than three millimeter. But still, you have a normal leaflet motion or discrete type 3B. There is no tethering. That's important. No tethering, and the distance is uh, below eight millimeter. In this case, you can propose again in isolated TR or concomitant TR a tracker speed valvular annuloplasty. Finally, you know that the ring annuloplasty is absolutely essential for the uh, long-term results, particularly the recurrency of MR. It's always important to keep in mind some surgical results to know that annuloplasty and ring annuloplasty is a key. Finally, and to conclude, if you have in stage three, you have a type 3B dysfunction, restrictive leaflet motion in systole, and particularly due to the right ventricle dilatation and or dysfunction. No coaptation, tethering is uh, above 8 millimeter, uh, 1.8 centimeter square as a surface. And in this case, you can propose, uh, and is often associated with torrential tear. If you have an uh, operable patient, you can uh, try a repair or replacement. But in inoperable and high risk patients, that's a group of patients we can consider transcatheter option. So in uh, functional uh, TR, as you can see here with uh, type 3B, it's uh, particularly important to consider transcatheter option, especially when we know it is a very large study, very recent study showing that there was no difference in terms of mortality between medical treatment and surgery in isolated TR. In conclusion, TR is a highly prevalent condition with poor prognosis. Multimodality imaging is key to assess TIA in a heart team approach. This is no more forgotten valve with recent advances in contemporary management based on valve analysis and stages of disease. Still, surgical ring annuloplasty is a gold standard, but clearly there are some unmet clinical needs, which is a plea for transcatheter option. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We would like to see as much audience interaction as possible. There are some microphones, so if you have any questions, you should please feel free to, to raise your voice um, so that we can understand some of your um, queries. Um, that was really an elegant description. Um, so do you think it really has been accepted uh, uh, that um, most of the patients we treat with uh, tricuspid regurgitation with transcatheter techniques is a step beyond severe. It's into this range that we're now calling massive or torrential. Um, now the concern we have is that when we get to this stage that the majority of these patients, or many may be your stage three. So they may be too far gone for many therapies. And that for instance, annular reduction by itself may not be sufficient. Uh, especially if there's significant tenting, as you showed in that last case. Absolutely. It's a, it's a plea for earlier intervention. That's mm -hmm. a message. We wait too long to have a, a severe right ventricular dilatation, dysfunction, and the patient has a very severe clinical uh, status, <coughs> and uh, it is associated uh, with a high mortality, uh, at least for <coughs> surgery. For transcatheter option, it's, it's not 
it's good indication, but sometimes it's difficult to treat severe tethering. So again, probably the best result will be obtained if we, we, we go earlier, or if we intervene earlier in the stages of the disease. And that's very important. That's why I emphasize to differentiate the three stages of the disease. We try now to go uh, to the stage two and not wait the stage three. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, but it's a problem for clinical trialists because many of the stage two patients are not very symptomatic. Well, they respond well just to gentle doses of diuretics. So you're treating patients that do not have great symptoms in an effort to change the natural history of the disease, which <coughs> makes perfect sense, but it also creates dilemmas in terms of being able to structure a clinical trial to prove this. It requires many patients and long-term follow-up to show differences. So exactly. most of the studies are focused on that stage three category who are very symptomatic and may be, as you say, a little bit too far. And probably there are some biological disorders who come a little bit earlier than symptoms and maybe we can also look carefully on the hepatic uh, and renal failure. Yeah, I think it's going to be a consistent theme um, and I'd love to hear Georg's comments too, um, also. Um, that we do wait too long to treat tricuspid <laughs> disease. And once we develop procedures that will be safe and that we feel confident that we can get consistent outcomes, then the trend will be to treat much earlier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the same discussion going on with mitral as with tricuspid. But right now we are prone with feasibility. We have to show that exactly. our, our, our tools work and reduce tricuspid regurgitation. And therefore, I guess we're going to stick to this patient group, this class three group uh, for a while. And until we have shown robust data there, I think then we can move forward to, to, the, to the earlier patients. But as you said, this will require large clinical trials because event yeah. rate will be much lower. Well, thank you very much, Alain. I'll introduce the next speaker, and then I'll turn it over to George. Um, um, so Claudius jacobs is going to talk about uh, in an innovative transcatheter approach to manage tricuspid valve disease. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, um, let me start with a short case presentation. This is a 68-year-old um, female with a dyspnea and reduced exercise capacity. She has very few comorbidities, hypertension, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, borderline pulmonary artery pressures, a preserved ejection fraction, and no coronary artery disease. In echo, she has a severe um, tricuspid uh, regurgitation, so it's not massive, it's not torrential, it's, it's severe. What should we do with this patient? So the first speaker said um, the gold standard is surgery, and, um, but he showed us that the outcome after surgery is uh, critical. So the numbers of um, surgery on tricuspid um, valves, isolated um, surgery, are increasing, but the mortality is still high, around 9%. And these patients in, in, in this study are not really sick and that they are not all very old. They are 62 years old and 20% um, has um, pulmonary hypertension or chronic kidney disease and only 12% had prior um, cardiac surgery. So that this is not a really sick patient population, but the mortality is 9%. So what about conservative diuretics? So in this study, um, 1,000 patients with moderate to severe TR were followed and uh, analyzed, and after 2.9 years, 42% of these patients died, and only 6% of these patients um, had a tricuspid um, uh, surgery. So, also a very poor prognosis with conservative treatment. What about interventional? The Edwards Cardioband Tricuspid um, System is the first CE-marked approved transcatheter um, device for the treatment of um, tricuspid regurgitation. It works through reduction of the annular size 
And the implant technique is very similar to the cardioband system that we know from the mitral system. It's a transfemoral approach and um, we go with a catheter with a guiding to the um, right atrium and we fixate the very flexible polyester cardioband to the annulus by screws, as you see here. At the end of the procedure, you cinch the cardioband to reduce the band and to reduce the annulus size and um, to facilitate the cooptation of the leaflets. Now we have uh, one year data for the uh, first pilot study, the trial repair um, study, where 30 patients were included. We see a persistent annulus reduction um, over the, the whole follow-up until one year. We see a persistent reduction in tricuspid regurgitation um, after 30 days and after one year. And we see that after one year, most of the patients um, have mild or moderate tricuspid regurgitation. The PISA went down significantly and also the vena contractor um, stays down after one year significantly. We see a good improvement in six minute walk test and we also see a good improvement in the quality of life of these patients. So the conclusion to the study is in early experience, the cardioband tricuspid system provides significant reduction in TR through annular reduction sustained at one year clinically and statistically significant improvements in functional status and quality of life and exercise capacity through one year. So going back uh, to our patient, after discussion in the heart team, we treated this female patient with a cardioband in tricuspid position, as you can see here, and um, we, we achieved a really good result um, coming from severe to trace, mm -hmm. And these are uh, other projections um, uh, showing a very good result. Thank you for your attention. Georg, you have any comments? A beauty, beautiful example. I mean, that was just a perfect patient and a perfect result. Uh, that would be my first comment on that patient. That that uh, I, I also uh, was very, very impressed but it's interesting because uh, this patient was treated a little bit earlier, as we were talking about. Um, these are not the patients that we're seeing, um, where the disease is, is much further along and the likelihood of achieving that level of high quality result is not as good. Um, I was impressed in the tri repair study, which treated some fairly sick patients, that there was no evidence of recurrence over the course of the first year, as best as I could see. That's true. And, and one other important point is the study I showed you with this 1,000 patients where after 2.9 years, 42% um, died. They also looked for the, the first echo before they went into the study. And they found that um, 4.9 4, 4 years earlier, most of the patients had a, a mild or trace tricuspid cogitation. So obviously it's a very progressive disease and it progresses in five years from mild to moderate to severe and it needs two or three years more to die or to get worse. So I think that patients like this female um, are probably good candidates to intervene early, not to go in this um, very terrible states later. Well, you presented a, a, a wonderful case with a great outcome. Um, I must say that not every case is, is quite uh, you know, as perfect as that in terms of an outcome. Um, and there are some patients that when you screen them, it's, it, uh, they may not be ideal candidates. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more th um, about that in a few moments. Um, but um, as you analyze patients, uh, and if you had a wish list of things you would like to see of a next generation device, what are the characteristics that you would like to see improved upon? I think it's still difficult to, s to screen and to find out if RCA 
uh, proximi proximity is a problem if um, if the annulus is, is too big, I think this is one of the things that um, um, has to improve because most of the patients that we screen has a too big annulus. And um, that's, that's one of the most reasons why, why cardioband is not possible. So I would like to see an improved screening, especially for RCI proximity and also larger cardiobands and maybe if it's possible to simplify the procedure. Um, maybe I can also comment on this, uh, uh, but one reason should be easy to to solve having having a longer cardioband. It's not so easy for for the engineers, but at the end of the day, we'll, they will come up with a solution. This is nothing which we cannot change, mm -hmm. and I think the RCA proximity was was a very very minor reason for screening failure within the tri repair study. That is uh, quite overestimated. In most of the patients, we would have been able to place the device. One major reason was uh, indeed that the, that the patient was too far gone and the annulus was already too wide. And second major reason is if the right ventricle is, is also too, too dilated and you have this severe tethering that the, that the leaflets are really torn to the apex, then you won't reach any benefit uh, with an annular device. But this is probably true for most other devices too. I think those are wonderful observations. Um, you know, we also, uh, you know, as we screen patients in the United States, the issue of proximity to the right coronary is one that we struggle with. Uh, we don't know if we're being too aggressive or non-aggressive enough. Uh, and that screening is usually done by CT imaging. Um, clearly, the, the device is too short for many tricuspid annuluses. So in the future, they'll need a larger device. And I think it is important to note that the procedure does take some time. Uh, and it takes experience. So there has to be uh, a density of experience before you get comfortable doing it. And the anchoring process is new to us. And the imaging to be able to precisely place the anchors in some patients is less than ideal. So those are things that I think need to be worked on in the, in the future. Um, but that was a wonderful case and a great example. George, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Yeah, thank you very much. So we covered, we covered this topic uh, a little bit already, how to identify the right patient for, for the cardioband uh, with patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And we are really excited to have you here, Patricio Lancelotti. He's going to share his thought on this topic. Thank you so much. I will be repeating a bit of what was said before. But anyway, uh, of course, it's not uh, an uncommon disease and uh, surgery is performed rarely in this kind of patients related to the high mortality rate. But first of all, just to highlight the importance of imaging as was done by Alain, uh, the treatment algorithm for tricuspid rigor starts first with the morphological assessment because treatment will differ in primary and secondary disorders. After that, once the mechanism has been determined, you need to clearly uh, evaluate the severity of the tricky speed rigors as well as the consequences on the right ventricle and pulmonary pressure. And what is important is to understand the relative contribution of the pulmonary hypertension, the tricky speed annular dilatation, as well as the right ventricular dysfunction remodeling with the leaflet tethering, because this can help you to decide which kind of treatment you can deliver to the patient. So it was highlighted this uh, discrepancy regarding the grading severity and the scheme that can be used in practice. But for sure, for general cardiologists, we recommend to use the three-level grading scheme. But maybe this failed to really capture the entire spectrum of the disease in the terms of uh, interventional cardiology and transcatheter approach. And that was the reason why it was first add a new grade, the massive, and after that massive and torrential, but maybe massive and torrential can be put together in clinical practice because as shown by Alain, this is associated with a substratification of the risk as compared to patients with severe tricuspid regurgitations. And that's something we need still to understand. 
So there are several factors really affecting the outcome of patients undergoing surgery, and all these factors have been highlighted. Mainly is the long term of the disease process, so the long standing with the patients with advanced age, with comorbidities, all these factors really expose the patients to a high risk of comorbidity and mortality during and after intervention. For transcatheter approach, of course, there are many challenges. These challenges relate to the complexity of the anatomy of the right ventricle, but also to the proximity to the right coronary artery, also to some anatomical findings like uh, navigating in the enlarged right atrium <coughs> and right ventricle could be challenging, like uh, the fact that application of uh, annular devices on this annulus could be very challenging related to the fact that we have a thin tissue and also a non-uniform uh, annulus that is not really circular. And uh, for sure, the connection between the inferior vena cava and uh, this uh, tricuspid annulus with this sharp angle can give you some difficulties in steering your catheter. Um, so imaging is challenging, for sure. This has been highlighted, but it's also important to guide and to select the patients. Uh, here you have an example. You know that with sizing of the tricuspid valve using uh, surgery, you use a sizer and taking into account the septal part. But uh, importantly to know is that the dilatation here occurs along the right ventricular free wall and the bimodal aspect of the tricuspid annulus is lost with, b uh, with the annulus becoming more flat and more circular. That's something important and the dilatation occurs at the level of the anterior and posterior leaflet attachment. So this means the anterior posterior commissure. And uh, for the device, we start the deployment here at the anterior septal commissure along the anterior posterior leaflet, and we finish here at the level of the posterior septal commissure. So all these features are related with a poor results in terms of surgery, but this could be the same in terms of uh, tricuspid annuloplasty performed transcutaneously. Uh, uh, that's very important to mention. So severe tethering, a large gap, uh, severe right ventricular dysfunction, severe pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular geometry with a very big right ventricle. And you know that this is important regarding the remodeling process. This is totally different in patients with idiopathic functional tricuspid regurgitus compared to those with pulmonary hypertension where you can see here the tethering is very huge. So, in practice, if we have to select a good candidate for the cardioband system, I would say we need to select the patients with a low degree of tethering, with a preserve or at least some degree of coaptation reserve, so no huge gap, uh, with no severe right ventricular dilatation, no severe pulmonary hypertension, and as mentioned before, regarding the size of the band, with no huge tricuspid annular dilatations, and this is a typical example of a uh, good candidate, and this is a huge tethering, uh, in this case, with excessive tethering on the patient. Uh, is a, a best maker a contraindication to the technique? No, except if you have, if you have some uh, lesion at the level of the tricuspid leaflet, like perforation, if you have a lead adherence, so interfering with the functioning of the tricuspid valve, if you have some impeachment or entanglement uh, with the core structure, this is a contraindication to the technique. Now, what about uh, the patient selection? The first step is to perform echo. This is the first screening. But don't forget that the patient suitable for echo can be unsuitable <coughs> after the CT scan. So after echo screening, CT scan is mandatory in this kind of population. So the first thing of CT is just to highlight the patient selection. Patient selection, how? First, by the distinction and identification of the presence of calcification. And you see here that significant calcification is a clear contraindication to the procedure. But this is less frequent than in mitral position. 
The second thing will be about coronary, right coronary artery, and this will be discussed a bit later after this slide. So now the second role of the CT scan that should be considered as a gatekeeper, very fundamental, is uh, the procedural planning and the suitability. So procedural planning for what? Because you can identify the good fluoroscopic projection, and secondly, you can have an ID or the perfect size that you can use, and also the contraindications if you have a very big tricuspid annulus, and here you have the different size of the implant that you can use, and you see that the maximum perimeter size is 120 millimeter that is measured according to the perimeter of the tricuspid annulus. So the connection with the right coronary artery is important because uh, if we have a close proximity, this is a contraindication because we can get injury of the right coronary artery. This seems to be more frequent in terms of proximity with the posterior leaflet than with the anterior leaflet, even if it was rare in the tree repair. So regarding now guiding the procedure and the imaging, for sure we can have imaging. We use often both uh, the uh, fluoroscopy and, uh, and the uh, 3, 2D, 3D echo. For the navigation with the fluoroscopy, this is uh, LAO codal, and we use the 3D and phase view. For the deployment, we use uh, the aerial cranial, and this is a multiplane uh, uh, MPR, so multiple plane reconstruction, or we can use simultaneous biplane uh, view. That's very important just to be sure that you are at the level of the annulus and not on the leaflets when you have your tip of the device. And for the adjustment, we often use the aerial cranial and also the 3D end phase view. When we want to be sure about the results and uh, of the procedure, we can use the three different aspects. So the 3D emphase view, the fluoroscopy, and of course the color Doppler. With the 3D emphase view, we can perfectly appreciate the reduction of the tricuspid annulus. This is uh, important. For the fluoroscopy, what is important is to measure and to distinguish the reduction between the distance of the different anchors, and this is for the cinching. And here with the color Doppler, we can appreciate the decrease in the color flow Doppler, so meaning a decrease in the tricuspid regurgitation. So ladies and gentlemen, just to conclude, of course, echo is the first step to use in terms of imaging in patients uh, for the screening. And after having a patient that seems to be a good candidate, we need to perform a CT scan to evaluate the size of the device, the presence and the extension of the calcification, and the proximity with the right coronary artery. During the procedure, we use, of course, fluoro in addition to 2D and 3D imaging. And when we have the chance to perform 3D and we use real-time multiple plane uh, reconstruction, this is very helpful during the procedure because it will give you your life easier. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Patricia, for this nice talk and these beautiful uh, pictures. Are there any questions from the floor? Maybe the first one. Otherwise, um, may, maybe I start. You, you, you referred a bit to the exclusion criteria. Um, it's more a comment, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm also curious to hear your comment on this. Uh, in the tri repair study, and, and Marty already mentioned that, we are, were a bit on the naive and very, very early side, and we included many patients with really torrential TR, and there were many patients who had a large coaptation defect, way, way above one centimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would think that the, the cardioband is, is, is not contraindicated in, in patients with a large co-optation defect, um, especially if you look also on the, on the portfolio of Edwards, what else is available maybe as a concomitant treatment. Could you maybe comment on this? But y you know, I, use very I was uh, very smart. I used careful wording. I said, ideal good candidate. <laughs> I didn't say contraindicated. <laughs> you see what I mean. 
uh, for sure, the ideal candidate is the one that I said, no severe tethering, no huge gap, etc. But in clinical practice, we need to understand that these patients, and especially those with torrential, torrential means huge gap. You cannot have torrential without the huge gap. It's uh, almost impossible. You can have severe with severe tuchospid dilatation annulus, but uh, torrential, it's a huge gap. So this means that, of course, we need to deal with these patients in practice, and uh, as a first step, we cannot exclude these patients from the experience. The sole real contraindication that I see is the proximity with the right coronary artery, the significant calcification of the annulus, and also this very huge annulus, because we don't have uh, the systems to cover the entire tricuspid annulus. But we'll have so, uh, hopefully very soon, it's the larger devices. And I mean, annular calcification, uh, this is probably existing, but uh, it's I uncommon. have to admit, I've never seen it on the right side. It's, uh, pretty, it's pretty uncommon, uh, you know, at least in the cases that we've screened. I mean, we've seen over the past year about 250 patients with severe TR and worse, and m maybe in one or two did we see any um, uh, uh, annular calcification. So it, it's, it, it, it's not too common. Um, I mean, one question I did have in the U.S., and maybe it's just U.S. and it's a fad or style, but um, we're, we're having an increased availability of 3D ice imaging to help guide the procedure. And I have to say that sometimes it's difficult to be able to get the right images to be able to place some of the anchors. I won't get into the specifics of where, and, but it seems that some of the operators are now believing that 3D ice can be incorporated into the procedural guidance in a very constructive way. Do you have any thoughts about that, Patricio? I, I don't have any experience with that, but for sure it could be an additive, you know, uh, an additional tools to be used when you have experience. Because the first thing to understand is the experience in the imaging that you need to have before starting this kind of procedure. So you need a Im good interventionalist, but a good imager in order to really deal with the case perfectly. Uh, but maybe, Alain, you, you use uh, ice and 3D because 3D is also something very uh, new. Huh? No, I agree with you. I, I don't believe in ice because they don't have 3D. And to, to be able to, to guide you, uh, we need a, a nice 3D image from the right atrium to be sure to place the, the mm -hmm. different uh, point at the right uh, position. And um, again, 3D is a key. 3D is key, not only because it gives you the, uh, the surgical view of the yeah. tracker speed, but also with the explain yes. methodology. Yeah. And ICE doesn't have explain. And explain is key, probably Becky told you. Yeah, that. and also you and know the size of the of the of the, of the window is so short yeah, that you cannot see. Yeah, well the time. windows are expanding. Yeah. Yeah. It's correct about explain, and you're also correct that Becky is not a great fan of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but but I think this is coming in the United States coming. already. The 80, 80 degree 3D ice has been approved, yeah. and we'll have it probably in, in the course of this year. So this will completely change our ice experience. And I uh, uh, finally we have an argument. Uh, yeah, but, I, but I just just I just I would I no. would I would totally agree with Marty. This will c to a very very great extent ease up the procedure. Yeah, but just to to tell you the truth, the angle and the window is so short that you cannot see the entire analyst. And I think during the procedure is something mandatory. You, you are you are talking about the, the poor man 3D eyes, yeah. which we had available so far. But there is novel 3D eyes available already in the United States, and this will change. This is from Siemens, and there will be a Philips, Philips device uh, very soon, and this will completely Happy change. Happy to see it. Yeah. <laughs> I think one thing which is important with the current uh, 3D <laughs> technology we have with uh, TEE, with um, uh, MPR, as you yeah. mentioned, MPR, uh, live MPR is very important with multi-view. You are very, very precise uh, when you, you put your you're not, and you can really guide you with a multi uh, planar reconstruction uh, online. And I hope uh, ICE will have it, but uh, still in progress. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you are right, Alain. And also <laughs> the fact that you have the treaty test set and you can jump directly into MPR, that's an advantage for so sure. So maybe one question, tethering. What would be the, the absolute cutoff for you? <laughs> one number. <laughs> you ask me these questions that cannot really yeah. answer. <laughs> for sure, if you want to say that uh, the tethering associated with recurrence of persistent circuit rigors after you know surgical repair it's 1.6 cm square but uh, this means nothing uh, i don't know exactly what would be the m you know the real cut off and uh, i would prefer to say that maybe in the near future we should use the volume of the tethering of the tenting rather than just a, a dimension like an area and the volume with 3d would be mandatory i think we'll move on to the last presentation and we'll ask Stefan Baldus to join us. <laughs> and he'll talk about the impact of the cardioband on patients with TR. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marty. I, I guess everything has been said. So what is the impact? What can give you a flavor of the impact of this device? I decided to show you uh, three cases which may illustrate it a little bit better even. <coughs> so. Uh, the, the first patient I want to show you is um, relatively young for, for our collective of, of patients, but he was symptomatic. He had edema, it was not severe, he had kidney disease, and f most of all he had hep hepatic congestion, and this was new. Um, it is remarkable, this patient, due to uh, the fact that he was um, a heart transplant uh, patient uh, a long time ago, and he was operated, conservatively operated on his aortic stenosis, a couple of years ago. So, so this patient was referred to us and our initial intent to do anything was uh, pretty low, but uh, the referring physician, he insisted on doing something given uh, this um, extremely progressive uh, and rapid um, progression of his disease. So um, what this shows you is um, severe tricuspid regurgitation, not torrential tricuspid regurgitation and um, and right ventricular function, which was slightly impaired, but not significantly impaired. Um, and so we went on and, uh, and treated this patient using a cardio band. You can see the uh, different positionings of the anchor, and you can appreciate uh, the fact that uh, the right coronary artery indeed is not only uh, something we have to take care of, but it's also a landmark um, uh, and a help actually to, mm -hmm. um, to put in the, uh, the cardio band, as uh, basically, basically shown here. So um, this is um, um, basically uh, the chinching maneuver. You, ha you have the beauty of chinching this sequentially, so you not only see this by echo, but also by, by fluoro, what's happening to your, to your annulus. And uh, in the end, you decide on, on where to stop, basically uh, using the echo. And uh, what, you what you can see here is um, that with progressive chinching, you indeed reduce um, uh, tricuspid regurgitation and if you look at uh, the um, uh, pictures before and after um, uh, the implantation of the cardioband you can see a reduction and this was really an impressive patient because uh, the liver enzymes which were quite significantly elevated completely came down and patient uh, dramatically improved clinically as well. So I have a second patient uh, for you and this was another interesting patient who was referred uh, to us from our nephrologist. So he had a mutation which uh, led to hypoplastic kidneys, um, a cystic kidney disease, a subtype of a cystic kidney disease also involving the pancreas. Um, and he was known for urologic infection, but he was extremely young. So he was uh, brought to us in, in our board to decide on, on what to do given the fact that he indeed also had severe tricuspid regurgitation. He was uh, having liver fibrosis, which was due to uh, hepatic congestion and believed to be uh, related to severe tricuspid regurgitation. As you can see here again, right ventricular function was not too bad. Um, and uh, you can see the, the tethering, which was, which was not extreme, uh, and annular dilatation as a reason uh, for the disease. And here, basically, you see um, uh, the same images you have seen before with um, the right coronary artery being the border of uh, the multiple anchors deployed. But what you can see on the right-hand side after changing to 5.0 is um, uh, the tortuosity 
the developing of the tortuosity of the right coronary due to the chinching. And I think this is another, well, advantage or beauty, if you want to say so, of the device that you can see this online and can decide what to do right by injecting into the right coronary. So um, you can indeed release the chinching a little bit, as, as shown here. And, um, and this uh, severe, extreme tortuosity um, of the vessel uh, resolves. Uh, the patient was fine regarding um, uh, the coronaries, didn't, was, uh, wasn't uh, uh, apparent ischemic and um, indeed improved with respect uh, to uh, the reduction of tricuspid regurgitation. As you can see here, the final result in this patient again shows um, uh, reduction of TR. And the last patient, a more typical patient, I guess, for this, uh, um, for this maneuver, um, an 81-year-old uh, uh, woman, severely symptomatic, known for leukemia, permanent atrial fibrillation, was sent to us and, again, also had um, severe tricuspid regurgitation. And this patient had a pacemaker. So this is something Patricio already um, uh, pointed out this is important to characterize the role of the pacemaker lead with respect to uh, to the pathology and the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation. Um, but we found that this indeed was not a problem; it was not the driver of tricuspid regurg. So we went on uh, for um, a uh, procedure and implanted. Um, the anchors. However, when we tried so, we had a problem that um, the, the pacemaker lead in the atrium was, was captured there by tissue and we were not able to circumvene and get around laterally uh, to, the, uh, to the lead of the pacemaker. So we in the end then accepted that we are not able to liberate the, the lead of the pacemaker and um, uh, were finally able to implant the band, but had um, entrapped the lead, which is uh, something you can do, as shown here in the posture septal uh, position. Um, you see the, the cardioband, but you also see the pacemaker lead, which is doable, which is not leading to, to dysfunction of the pacemaker, and which is not impacting on the overall result if uh, you can entrap it the way I just showed you. You see the remarkable reduction in uh, uh, the diameters in uh, the short and long access views and you see that um, indeed uh, the degree of tricuspid regurgitation at the end of the procedure was uh, quite favorable. So this is what I wanted to show you, three cases of a little bit unusual etiology perhaps or un unusual patients which may illustrate what this um, band direct annuloplasty can do in selected patients. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stefan, for this uh, really beautiful, outstanding, uh, outstanding cases. Um, any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, Stefan, I watched the time on the echo scan to show before and after the procedures, and I noticed it was between three, three and a half, and six hours. The, the beginning and end of procedure echoes. Is that the typical implantation time for the? Patrick, I'm amazed that you look at the <laughs> most irrelevant <laughs> detail <laughs> of the slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> it, it might well be that, I mean, six hours procedure time is not usual, obviously. Uh, but in the end, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the, uh, the learning class, we, we took our time, yeah, and it, it took longer. So I think two to three hours is, but is still realistic and it's, uh, it's a, as, as we discussed, it's a, a long-lasting uh, procedure and you shouldn't be stressed. Uh, uh, so you should be able to do this um, and take your time identifying the right spot for the anchors. Was and probably also a change from summer to winter time or something. Georg, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what do you mean by this? Do you think we do this uh, uh, trans-seasonally? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you, but you you showed this um, this very interesting case with a pacemaker lead. Uh, could you could you comment on this a bit more? Is this a, a contraindication, or how 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 do you have to handle usually the device yeah. uh, not to get into trouble with the with the leads? So, so I think the first thing you have to look is uh, as as um, 
Patricia already showed you, um, that there is no impingement of the lead, so that the, the lead is so mobile that it can be uh, uh, positioned in a commissure. If this is the case, then you should try to get around uh, the pacemaker with your system in order to not entrap it. But if this is not possible, and this was one case where usually this is possible, but if it's not possible, it's not a problem. As, as I showed mm -hmm. you, um, you can indeed uh, go around it and uh, get good functional results. So to answer your question, Georg, no, it's not a contraindication at all. And I think this is important since quite a substantial percentage of patients with GR indeed have um, pacemaker leads, yes. I wanted to also uh, comment that, that the observation of the coronary angiogram is fascinating as you do the annular um, cinching. Um, but I will tell you, we don't do angiograms after surgery, and I suspect that in many surgical cases you will see the same thing happen to the right coronary artery. Uh, it probably does relax after time. To have control over being able to to adjust it a little bit is a very nice thing, but I know that no one talks about this, but I think that it's probably associated with not just transcatheter, but surgical annuloplasty as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think it was almost almost a constant finding in the dry repair yeah. study, and there was not a single, single clinical event yeah. related to that. For the um, coronary artery uh, in surgery, uh, Gilles Dreyfus has a specific maneuver to avoid right coronary artery. The um, important stitches which can really uh, injure the right coronary artery at the level of the antero-posterior commissure at uh, one o'clock. So he puts the stitches, he pulls down the stitches and he goes to the surface of the right ventricle and he sees if there is a depression close or at the level of the right coronary artery, because it happened to him, mm -hmm. and uh, he used this uh, type of maneuver. So it happened in surgery, you're right. For the lead, 3D is absolutely essential. There are many papers from Roberto Long, for example, to show that the, the position of the lead is essential uh, for the exclusion or to see if there is a lead in the commissure or fixed to uh, a valve with a restrictive motion of the posterior leaflet, but at least 3D is essential to see if the lead is blocked at uh, one of the commissure, particularly the antero-posterior. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, clearly Gilles Dreyfus is an artist when it comes to tricuspid repairs, but I think much of what we see is not due to injury from the anchors to the coronary, but simply traction of the annulus will cause a conformation change in the right coronary artery, which will give you this appearance of kinking, which over time tends to sort itself out and relax. With regard to procedure time, I think you make a good observation. There have been procedures that have been as long as six hours, um, and they've been as short as an hour, a little over an hour, um, uh, and I think that you really do have to have some experience, uh, but I also agree with Stefan that in the beginning, you have to take your time. And you have to be willing to, to um, uh, have uh, reinforcements in the cath lab um, because some of the procedures can be lengthy. But over time, our expectation is that with the right experience, you should be able to do this procedure in approximately two hours, two and a half hours on a routine basis. That would be the goal. I think it would be um, unrealistic to think you can do it in an hour or less, but I think that that is a reasonable goal to be able to achieve a result um, that is long-lasting. Yeah, I think I, c I couldn't agree more. And with this, uh, I would uh, like to, to summarize a bit because we are uh, ahead of time al already. I think imaging is absolutely key in this procedure, but there is so much advantage going on right now, not only with flexi slice and 3D volumes in the TEEs, the, the, com the computers uh, and the the power of the even of the TUE machines has accelerated qu quite substantially over the last years, and now we're gonna face uh, this uh, 3D, this real 3D eyes. This will further ease up the procedure. And if we look at the data we have right now, the procedures which took only an hour or one and a half hour were the procedures with perfect imaging because the device mm -hmm. is very, very easy to handle. It's very intuitive and if you see what you do, you can finish this procedure really quickly. There are some, some um, 
things to be done with a device. This is the first generation device, but be sure that Edwards and the smart engineers, and there's one of the smartest I know in the back, uh, Tal Sheps, they are working, they are working on further generations of, of the device and they will uh, come up with solutions. And I'm absolutely sure that this de device will play a major <laughs> role because remember, the leading pathology of tricuspid regurgitation is annular dilation and therefore it, it <coughs> will be a good idea to tackle this annular dilation. With that I thank you all, all the speakers, uh, Marty, my co-chairman and you for your attention and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.